This video introduces an initial analysis of a Brabham BT52 Formula 1 car model using computational fluid dynamics, known as CFD. This is the first of a series presenting aerodynamic analysis of historic Formula 1 cars using CFD as a tool. The idea is that applying contemporary analysis tools in a historical context could provide an interesting insight as to how or why these cars did or didn't work. When these cars were designed in the 80s and 90s, CFD did not exist or was only beginning to be established. In the 2000s, Formula 1 teams possessed some of the world's most powerful supercomputers tasked with this job. Sauber's 2005 computer Albert was equipped with 500 processors, 1 terabyte of memory and 10 terabytes of storage. Not spectacular by today's standards as you could do something similar for about $20,000. But this all leads to today CFD being a fundamental part of the design and development of a race car. Utilising methods derived from digital technology such as CFD would make it possible to retrace the evolution of aerodynamic devices from racing's pre and early digital age. In Formula 1 this coincides with the building up of aerodynamic performance from the low of 1983 with the banning of ground effects. Aerodynamics began to re-establish itself as the most influential component in a car's performance. In addition, the floor became the greatest contributor to downforce, contributing around 60% through the rediscovery of ground effects. Through experiments on historical Formula 1 cars, like the one being done here, we can track the rise in aerodynamic performance. So it all starts with the Brabham BT52 from 1983. This car is one of the most recognisable in Formula 1, with a distinctive arrow shape and iconic blue and white livery. In 1983, one of the biggest changes in Formula 1 regulations came into force. The introduction of the flat floor fundamentally changing the design philosophy of Formula 1 racing. Introduced in September 1982, these changes caught out the majority of the field who had already, in some cases like Brabham, built their 1983 car with the old rulebook. These cars were focused on using the substantial forces generated by ground effects. The forces were so great that a small change in center of pressure would significantly change the force distribution between the front and rear wheels. With the introduction of the flat floor eliminating these enormous forces, it thus upturned the design philosophy Formula 1 engineers were implementing. With the BT52 born from this small window of time, the result was a car that could be called highly aesthetic. It is considered by some one of the most attractive Formula 1 cars of all time. It is at least one of the most unique. It was also successful giving Nelson Piquet the world championship that year. Banning the large tunnels of air underneath the car simplified the aerodynamics dramatically. Now a front and big rear wing was the order of the day. The principle that governed the Brabham's design was the pursuit of mechanical grip. The thinking was that the aerodynamic grip was not going to be as influential as the mechanical grip for performance. With enormously powerful turbocharged engines, producing some 700 to 800 horsepower in qualifying trim, 640 otherwise, getting the most out of this available power was important. Thus it was determined that the rear of the car should have a lot of grip, such as biasing the mass distribution rearwards helps increase traction in acceleration. Clearly from the volume of the car this was achieved with the rear having all the bulk and the front being slender. The numbers reinforce this observation with a 37 split front to rear. To achieve the most amount of rear downforce, the impact the chassis had on the rear wing was minimised through the lowering of bodywork. This became a trait of Gordon Murray's design over the next few years, producing a series of low slung cars with large rear wings. Required for CFD simulations, a CAD model is needed. The model was produced by collecting images and basic dimensions like wheelbase and width. It is not an exact reproduction of the actual car, but a simplified representation. It is good enough to develop an understanding of how the car generates drag and lift. The experiment here is to try and understand how the car produces downforce and how much it would influence the car's performance. Ideally, the aerodynamic balance produced by the downforce would match the weight distribution 30 front, 70 rear. This would mean that the grip distribution when mechanically derived or aerodynamically dominant is always the same. From the description the drivers gave the handling of the BT-52, with it being odd or difficult, it is likely that the aerodynamic characteristics would follow, even if the aerodynamic balance matched the weight distribution. The experiment was conducted with open foam software running the incompressible RAS numerical model and the SSTK Omega turbulence model. 
Air velocity was 50 meters per second with a rotating wall function on the wheels. Height was set flat at 60 millimeters. The CAD model was divided up into body, wheels, and rear wing, which meant that the forces could be extracted independently. The forces were combined to give the front and rear distribution. Three simulations were run with different front wing flap angles, starting with seven degrees forming the baseline. Then the flap was increased to 17 because the lift numbers were so bad, and then subsequently to 22 degrees. At looking at all the online images of the BT-52, an angle more than this is unlikely. The results from the simulation can be taken in a number of different ways. But understanding how they are a consequence of the flow around the body is important. So in addition to the table of forces presented, pressure, kinematic energy, wall shear stress maps, and angular velocity images are extracted to help identify important flow structures that influence that result in forces. Considering the steady state numerical model used here is postdictive rather than predictive, the differences in the output when the car model is changed are noted. Therefore, the relative changes when the front wing flap angle is changed, any difference is then measurable. It is these outputs that form the basis of our comparative analysis. So the table of forces here shows the influence the front wing has on the model components by presenting the output forces. Typically, the output considered most important is the drag and lift component. Taking this coefficient, the forces can be calculated as a product of half the frontal area velocity squared. This is considered helpful with calculating performance over a range of speeds, such as throughout a lap. However, the aim of this experiment is to construct a comparative analysis of a model at one speed, 50 meters per second. Therefore, the force output will form the focus of our analysis. From observing the raw numbers here, the effect the front wing angle change has on the vehicle appears to be dramatic. The four main points are, the drag drops with increased angle, overall there was less downforce, there was an increase in downforce for the body, there was a reduction in both drag and lift for the rear wing. The resultant forces on the wheels can be derived from the summation of forces in the Z axis. The moment's output around the rear wheels gives the force distribution. Therefore, at 22 degrees flap angle, the forces on the front wheel is 71 newtons, and on the rear is 736 newtons. Not quite the 30-70 split design, but much better than at the lower angles where the rear wing is trying to lift the front wheels off the ground. Drag is not considered in the resultant force calculations because it depends on how the forces are applied to the car from the wheels and it is not as straightforward as it seems. It is likely that in acceleration, the drag is significant enough to reduce the front wheel's resultant force. The result would be understeer in high-speed acceleration. The drag is dominated by the wheels. They also provide positive lift. Generally, from an aerodynamics perspective, the wheels are just the worst exposed like this. Observing the pressure map, an idea of where the output forces are generated can now be developed. The pressure map uses blue to indicate low pressure and the red high. The limited scale is used to accentuate the low and high pressure zones that can draw our focus. The background image is from the low flap angle, whereas the rotating body is the high flap angle. The rotating body shows where most of the drag is created but it isn't really important for understanding downforce. With the rear wing dominating the downforce numbers, the other parts of the car are responsible for the balance. The rear of the body is the most influential part of the body for the low flap angle, whereas the front is for the high flap angle. In this setup, the front wing has poor interaction with the body and the floor particularly, contributing to a high pressure zone under the driver. You can see that the rotation of the wheels produces a low pressure on top. Not much can be done with this, however, as the wheels are always exposed like this. The 2022 regulations allow for development in the area above the wheels, which could be interesting. The wall shear stress mapping starts to indicate how air flows around the vehicle. The idea with the wall shear stress is that the zero velocity air near the body is pulling the free stream air along with the body. So the output map is a result of the air at the body creating a shear force which becomes greater if the airflow velocity is high or accelerating. Therefore the bluer area means that the air velocity is lower and or is accelerating less by the body than the lighter or redder colored areas. 
The streaks that appear tend to flow in the direction of the air velocity, changing colours with the differences in flow velocity because of upstream disturbances, like the front wing. The key points here is the rear floor section and, and how the air rises up the chassis side in front of the radiators. The first thing I usually look at for any vehicle is the pressure map of the floor. The difference between low and high flap angle is dramatic. Even the underside of the rear wing is obviously different. The additional 141 newtons of downforce with the high flap angle is all coming from the front as the rear floor section may have less. By using the steady state output, the slices taken through the x-axis along the body is relative to space, not time. The images provide a cross-section of the pressure in the airflow around the car. The first set of images is the flap at 7 degrees. A high pressure field appears before any component like wheel, wing or helmet. Low pressure areas appear under surfaces or inside vortices. The second set is the flap at 17 degrees. This shows more disturbance behind the front wing, which goes on to influence the rear of the car. The image which tells us the most about the rear wing performance would be taken just before the rear axle and wing. The high pressure field is slightly smaller in front of the rear wing, meaning that there is less free stream flow impacting it. Here these images show that the low pressure volume above the rear wheel is slightly smaller on a high flap angle than is present on the low setting. There is also differences on the inside of the wheel indicating that the mass volume of the rear wheel is moving less or has more had, or has more rotational turbulence energy with higher flap angles. With the reduction of drag from the body following a similar logic, there is more pressure equating to less volume behind the radiators and it could be assumed that the cause is the same. Setting up the next X movie for kinetic energy, this image of a kinetic energy ISO volume shows how the air is energized by the car. The X movie is essentially the cross section of this image. One point of interest worth mentioning first is the influence or minimum influence that the body has on the rear wing if you follow your eye back along the airstream from the roll hoop. This sequence of images show how the energy is put into the airstream from the car's movement. The key observation are the rotating air volumes. Turbulence is the unstructured rotating mass, particularly observed behind the rear wheels. The reason why the body becomes less draggy with a paradoxical increase in flap angle could be seen here with the difference in turbulence impacting the radiators. There is significantly more turbulence with a high flap angle. These images and plots are one of the main points of this analysis. The plots map the longitudinal pressure distribution from underneath the car's centerline and 20 millimeters off the centerline. Even though the floor, in this case, isn't as effective as later car models, it still shows all the important bits for creating downforce from the floor. The difference between the low flap angle and the high flap angle produces differences in pressure along these plots in the key points A, B and C. The point at A, the area behind the front wing will slowly increase in pressure as the boundary layer increases to B. B is a high pressure region reducing downforce because the air is slowing down relative to the car's speed or increasing relative to the free stream. After B, the air starts accelerating as the low pressure field of the rear wing and diffuser start to interact. To finally C, the entrance of the diffuser. The air accelerates into the diffuser and out the back of the car. In this case, the gearbox is blocking the exit and stopping some of the air accelerating. These graphs here suggest the front wing is a bad idea, and from the numbers the total car produces more downforce with less wing. This reminds me of the delta wing which I consider influenced by the BT-52. The problem with the delta wing was where the front wheels were situated. Having the wheels in board meant that air was considerably disturbed when flowing underneath the chassis. It would have been far more efficient to mount very thin covered wheels outboard of the chassis. In the end, the delta wing just couldn't produce enough downforce. A vortex EX movie is a much better way to visualize flow structures than the previous pressure and kinetic energy maps. In this case, the high front wing flap angle of 22 degrees was used. Here you can see the difference between flow structure and turbulence. 
By the time the air reaches the radiators, it's mostly just turbulence. Similarly, the impact of the rear wing is seen more clearly than before to have been influenced by this turbulence. So in these last three images, the turbulence rises above the radiators, meaning the rear wing is not in free stream anymore. Even though these images aren't the best, they are still worth considering. A Q ISO volume illustrates the turbulence coming off the front wheels and the interaction with the front wing. Note the length of the vortex from the front wing end plate in the second image is longer than the first. Lastly, back to the wall stress images. These are an indicative comparison of how the front wing flap angle changes the airflow and why it affects the downforce levels. Clearly, the difference in flow is obvious. The high flap angle disturbs the airflow of the floor significantly. The effectiveness of the floor can be directly traced back to the front of the car disturbing the airstream. Though the balance of the car is actually improved as a result, there is almost 4.5% less downforce. There is a lot going on here, but at the same time, not much. The BT-52 has primitive aerodynamics, which isn't a surprise due to the time frame of development. Aero balance is created by destroying aerodynamic efficiency. I suspect the paradoxical nature of its aerodynamics would be accentuated when vehicle dynamics modes like yaw and rake are added. Otherwise, the design decisions that Murray implemented with the low slung body and the weight distribution are successful.